Hi, TopCast listeners. Don't forget to check out the TopCast website for links to resources cited in each episode and other show notes. You'll find us at topcast.online.ucf.edu. You can subscribe right on the site so that you never miss another episode. And now you can sign up to get an automated email notification whenever a new episode is released. From the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning, I'm Tom Cavanaugh. And I'm Kelvin Thompson. And you are listening to TopCast, the teaching online podcast. Greetings, Kelvin. Greetings, Tom. That's my favorite podcast. That's what you said last time. Yeah. Or some time ago. It still holds true. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is still my favorite podcast. It's, there's always a threat that maybe yeah. it'll cease being. It'll go down in the rankings well, on my podcast app. I've found some new ones lately, and I've really been enjoying them. And frankly, they are much better than ours. But strangely enough, this one is still my favorite. <laughs> I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> I can relate to that entirely. So um, we are off and running here. Um, this is Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. The last of this season. Is that that's, right? I believe that's correct. Wow. It's hard to believe. A whole year of this nonsense. Yeah. You know, I don't know. You want to keep doing this? Yeah. Well, we'll do it for one more episode. All right. And then, then we'll go from there. We'll <laughs> look at, at next year. So this <laughs> this right. should be, if it airs in the sequence that we think it will, um, be number 12. So, Wouldn't it be funny if it was number one? And number one. Well, if you're listening machine. to this and, and it is not labeled correctly, then <laughs> we have not edited it properly. That's right. So, um, this means that I have had 11 different, give or take a couple of repeat, coffees with you. That's true. And if tradition holds, there will be one more today. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. I think that's true. Actually, I just ran out and was late for us recording here um, because I picked up a coffee for both of us from a new-to-me cafe just four, count them, four miles away from where we sit. I did this because we're going to talk briefly, you didn't know this, but we're going to talk briefly about coffee cafe conflation. That's a new thing I just invented. Coffee cafe conflation. Coffee cafe conflation. Sells seashells by the seashore. That's right. It's alliterative. So some cafes are linked inexorably and understandably to the coffees they serve. Some of these roast their own coffee on site. We've been to one of those up in Tallahassee. Yeah. Remember the Catalina Cafe? That I was nice. I do remember. They had a, what was it, a clover? Uh, no. 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 They, had a, they had a roaster and they had a nice, they did a pour over and it was it was good. You I, had, I think you had a Yerga Chef. It was nice. Yeah. I, <laughs> you enjoyed it. I did. Yeah, <laughs> I obviously can't say it, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> and so, you know, so some roast on site, some serve like a licensed coffee of some sort. Um, some cafes are in the business of being an excellent third space where they provide a great setting for conversation or work or whatever, where carefully curated high end coffees are part of the overall ambiance. So, in those kind of places, like the Vesper down the street, the coffee and the setting have a relationship, but they're not the same thing. So, I'm going to pour this. Here for you. I don't know what you've put in that um, in that cup uh, as well. But this is a Nicaragua Kailash from northern Nicaragua, oh, near Nicaragua Honduras. Nicaragua Kailash, you say? Yes, that's right. Uh, I think it's kind of nice. I've had this before. It was tasty. Okay. Uh, so in today's episode, we're going to talk about conflation of another sort, in which online education is seemingly linked inexorably with the LMS. But first. Taste this coffee. See All right, what you think. wait. Let me let me uh, dress it up. It's nice. Nicaraguan Kailash yes. rhymes with eyelash. I guess, but hopefully there were none of those uh, put in this cup because that would be kind of gross. I like. Mm-hmm. It's good. I'd, I didn't bring the uh, the more avant garde one that I had a couple times because I'm like it's a little edgy, but this one I like a lot. It's just, it's very tasty, very forgiving. So the LMS. Yes. And online education. Yes, that is what we're talking about today. That's good. Why don't you tell the home audience what LMS stands for? Hmm. Okay, here's here's a funny story. So LMS, generally speaking, stands for Learning Management System. And this is one of those areas, Tom, in which you have actually done what many people have been unable to do before, and that is change my behavior. <laughs> really? Yes. How so? Well, because, you know, you've always been consistently a learning management system LMS kind of guy. Historically, I was a course management system uh, CMS kind of guy. You were one of those I was one people. of those people. Yeah. You know, because I insisted on holding to the principle that you can't manage learning. You can maybe manage a course. 
and the software could be helpful to you as you go about managing a course. We can't manage learning, but then there were content management systems. Well, I must confess, at one point, I was an LCMS guy. Well, there you go, learning content management mm-hmm. system. Uh, yeah, exactly. And you got all this, all these acronyms going around. And finally, um, you know, I just really everybody else was doing it, going to learning management system, and then people were getting confused over content management system. So I finally just gave up, and called it learning management system. Yeah, because you know, WordPress is a content management right, system. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, learning management systems. If you know anything about online learning, you've probably heard the uh, the acronym LMS. We hope. Yes, and so I think I understand your coffee conflation uh, conundrum. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah, that's uh, that's a quadro uh, <laughs> <laughs> alliterative. alliterative. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, because um, a lot of people think that uh, online learning is an LMS, and an LMS is an online learning, and and, and perhaps. With some justification, because I often hear complaints from faculty that the LMS, with its inherent affordances and limitations, forces them into certain kinds of course designs and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. certain kinds of student interactions. And, and perhaps the more critical ones might claim that it doesn't allow them to do the kinds of things they want to do just because the system is designed a certain way. So, right, you right. know, self-fulfilling prophecy, there it is. Yeah, abs- absolutely, absolutely. So, I don't know, we talked about this briefly before we hit record or before professionals who uh, were trained in the in the, in the the pressing of record. We have a vast uh, team behind us who That's, know how to press the record button. Don't call them vast. <laughs> they're very fit people. They are. They're healthy. Don't be offended. Don't be, they're waving. You know, or put that finger down. That was not very nice at all. Um, so we talked about Maybe three things here, right? Where are we? Where have we been? Where are we going? Does that sound all right still? Sounds good. Okay, so where are we, Tom? We're sitting in a, in a studio <laughs> in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> That's good. Um, so, yeah, I guess maybe we've kind of already started touching on that, that online learning isn't necessarily the same as learning management system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you, it's really hard to separate one from the other just because of of practice and um, what has become recent tradition. Yeah, that's funny, right? I mean, it seems, you know, I saw um, a little factoid uh, from Phil Hill in this uh, blog post that he did. Uh, I pulled some data together and this, the one little thing that really stood out to me, and we'll talk about some other ones in a minute maybe, but uh, homegrown LMSs, apparently still around some. Yeah. And in this uh, this one little graphic that he had, it had like how, how long each of uh, the the brands of LMS had been at uh, institutions, and homegrown was a category. Yeah, and it was like twenty three point something years. I'm like, somebody had an LMS that they built themselves, and they've had it for over twenty three years. I hear those stories once in a while, and and it, it baffles me sometimes, but it's still out there. Yeah, you know, and we we get a lot of visits from yeah. other schools who yeah. kind of are interested in how we do online learning. And every so often somebody comes through and is like, "Oh yeah, we've got this proprietary right. system we've built and yeah, it's not quite doing the job. So tell us about your LMS." Right, and, right. And I'm I think it's amazing that they've been able to continue to <laughs> support and yeah. expand a yeah. a proprietary homegrown system. Um, when we were looking at our LMS um, migration a few years ago, you know, we operate at a, a fairly large scale. We do a lot of online learning. And um, it, it didn't even occur to us that, one, we could build something ourselves or that um, or that we would be able to choose a provider that couldn't handle our scale. Mm-hmm. So. We needed a company that did nothing but build LMSs right. and support them as their full-time R&D and ongoing job. Yeah. And um, and for you to be doing it kind of on the side mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. is uh, is both impressive and horrifying at the same time. Right. I guess, you know. No what, offense to anybody who's doing no, that. No, I'm totally all. impressed by you. Yeah, I'd kind of really like to find out more about it. Yeah. You know, I'm fascinated, like, okay, how big a deal is the LMS at the institution? And, you know, is it a little peripheral thing or is it a, a central thing? And have you been able to uh, keep it supported well and all that? Because I know yeah. how difficult it is here when somebody else built it. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating. But, yeah, from that same graphic, it was like uh, the average length of time that uh, institutions have had their current LMS was uh, almost nine years, 8.8 8 years. That's interesting. Which sounds like a long time, It doesn't does, it? yeah. Although, if you think about it, I mean, we've been on our current LMS for three years. Prior to that, it was, what, 15? 
Yeah, that's true. Through various versions of it. Yeah, that's that's true. Okay, so here's a little, this kind of goes out of sequence, I guess, but uh, a little bit of lore. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard this story, right? So according to lore, Murray Goldberg himself flew down from the University of British Columbia with a CD I on which <laughs> WebCT, uh, you know, the original 1.0 or whatever it we was. We probably still have the computer he installed it on. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think, is that the one I'm using? <laughs> Might be, yes. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, we installed it and, and we went from there and we were WebCT for a long time and Blackboard and, and, and so forth. But things have changed a lot, right? So Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, it's interesting. There is a, an, a fairly well-known um, infographic that that shows the state of the LMS. Um, and I think it gets updated every year. If I'm not mistaken, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a campus computing project mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. does it. Casey um, does those. And it shows the, um, the <laughs> consolidation of the marketplace, where on the left side of the chart, you see all of these different players. And over time, they've either been swallowed up by each other or mm -hmm. gone out of business or bought by each other. And now we're down to a few um, in the marketplace that kind of um, that, that dominate, I would say, at most a half a dozen. And some of those are much bigger than, than others, obviously. And then there's kind of every flavor. If you want um, open source versus mm -hmm. commercial versus something you can run yourself versus, you know, cloud or on premise or you know every variety of of approach you can kind of get it and what surprises me kelvin tell me tom is that there seem to every year or two be new entrants into the marketplace hmm. and it, i am surprised by that because i mm -hmm. keep thinking that the the marketplace is pretty mature which you know maybe it's not but is pretty mature, and there are a few players that seem to have a lot of market share, but then every so often, new ones pop up. And so, you know, the one that seems to be making a lot of noise now is in structure and Canvas, yeah, right. which is only a couple of years old. Yeah. Um, but then there are new things like Schoology mm -hmm, that keep mm -hmm. coming up, and then there are, there are others as well. So it seems like, yeah, just as some go away, whether it's Angel or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, new ones come into the marketplace. Well, so interesting, right? So I think it may have been um, some some data from uh, Justin uh, Maynard from um, List Ed Tech into the year. Uh, but looking at exactly what you said, that according to the chart that I found from him, it was uh, like maybe arguably three commercial LMS vendors with over ten percent of the higher ed market. Uh, I think Blackboard, D2L, and, and Structure. And then, of course, you mentioned open source and Moodle. Uh, open source still has a pretty yeah. pretty good chunk of, of uh, the higher ed market. And depending how you, how you, um, you run Moodle, right. it could be that that could be a commercial right. offering as well if you have a, some sort of right. a, a partner running it on your behalf. Right. Or Sakai even, um, if somebody's running that on your behalf, um, you're paying somebody to manage that for you, so but is that open source or not? Right, exactly, and I don't know how exactly they calculated um, that in for that particular uh, graph either, but I was fascinated too by, um, you know, Pearson will show up on some of those historic, um, up until very recently, yeah. historic uh, charts uh, with some segment of the market, and, you know, they announced not long ago that they were kind of getting out of the, the LMS business with, I thought this was fascinating, this statement that they're leaving to focus on products and services, I think it was something like, quote, where the learning actually happens or closer <laughs> to where the learning happens. And this is interesting since, uh, I don't know, how many LMSs did they own? Right. Two or right, three? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so when they go down to that like individual, more granular level, like, okay, there will be an LMS in there somewhere, but we're not going to focus on that. So I think that's interesting. So they're a big company, right, and divesting themselves of that. As you say, others are coming into the market at the same time. So very intriguing. So that's kind of a little bit of where we are, or where yep. we've been. Yep. Uh, certainly, that lore. Um, where are we going? Right. That's sure. <laughs> that's next. And uh, there's been a lot of um, of predictions of the death of the LMS, right? Which that's I think true. the predictions of its demise have been a bit premature. That's true. And you know, I told you before, I don't really do predictions, but I did. I went back and looked, and I did a little personal podcast for a while a number of years ago in uh, 2008 I think it was I put a little little nine minute segment together why the course management system is not going away well then you weren't wrong I wasn't wrong yeah. you know because the course I love management it. system did go away oh <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> wait, well, a, wait second. a minute. You were wrong. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Like, oh, man, I'm yeah. still O for a million or something, whatever, whatever that is. Yeah, I mean, I think things are a lot more flexible uh, now, and I think they're only going to get more flexible, right? But going back to behind us for a second, you know, one thing, I just want to give a shout out to Brigham Young University. They had this loosely coupled grade book concept for a while. And I love the idea of that. Basically, here's a grade book, here's authentication into that, here's your educational records, and then there's a variety of ways of pulling things into that. John Mott, you know, was advocating mm-hmm. for that. I literally, before uh, today's episode, I found a vintage, this is hilarious, I didn't, I don't think I've ever seen this before, uh, a vintage nine-minute interview recording between John Mott and Jared Stein, who's now at Instructure, uh, talking about the loosely coupled gradebook <laughs> program. So I don't, that I know of, that has not gone anywhere uh, further, but, you know, now the modern LMSs are seeming to build upon that, you know, through things like uh, learning tools, interoperability, right, yeah, LTIs, yeah. And, and other concepts. That's that flexibility is a thing. Yeah, well, and, and it's a fundamental premise that it, that Canvas is, is yeah. built upon, but certainly not exclusive to, right. to Canvas. Right. Well, and it, and it even harkens back to the work that Jim Groom did at mm-hmm. Mary Washington, where I mean, he was definitely in the camp of, I don't need no stinking LMS. Sure. I, can, um, I can build a robust, interactive online learning environment using, you know, blogs and apps and all kinds of other tools. Right. And that's certainly true mm-hmm. if you're Jim Groom and you're willing to put in the effort. Right. You know, right. I mean, most of the faculty here, I imagine, probably aren't willing to kind mm-hmm. of do that kind of, you know, very effective but, you know, time-consuming work to build yeah. a course in that fashion. It's more boutique, mm-hmm. you know, I guess we'd mm-hmm. say, rather than uh, enterprise scale. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like Fox Mulder sometimes, you know, <laughs> like, you know, I want to believe. The truth know, is out there. The though. truth is out there. And I want to, and I, I really respect, you know, the whole edupunk thing and, and Jim Groom and, and uh, the, the blogging thing and, and being outside the LMS and all that. But I know that while an individual instructor might want to do that and be willing to mm-hmm. put in that kind of time and effort, he can't build an institution right. uh, online education program on that kind of and, activity. And if, you, if we look at our own operation here, we're built for scale. Yeah. And it's really hard to scale a artisan <laughs> yeah, right. learning management That's approach. Nice. That's better than boutique these yeah. days. It's artisan, <laughs> artisan coffee. Yeah. Um, th- not that either one is bad. But, right. You no, know, right. There are there are advantages and disadvantages to to each approach. Yeah. So, kind of what what Groom was doing, and then I've heard um, Ray Schroeder talk about this also uh, previously, where the future of the LMS is just a series of personal apps mm-hmm. that you can plug together to build your own kind of personalized learning environment, mm-hmm. and I think. It, that is in many ways coming true. If we look yeah, at the, the space that. today, it's it may not ex- be exactly what Ray predicted at that time, but I, I think he was on to something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you mentioned LTI. Yeah. I think through LTI, um, we're doing quite a bit of that, mm-hmm. quite a bit of that here. Uh, and, and some of our sister institutions around the country, Utah State and Berkeley and others, are, uh, are also doing some really interesting things with LTI. No, I, I think that's right. I think that kind of flexibility and and um, putting things together in, in some kind of reliable way makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's int- right now, the LMS is still the core of that. Like, <laughs> this is a horrible metaphor, but uh, I think maybe just this visual came to mind of like, uh, you know, the, the blank for a Mr. Potato Head, right? You know, there's the <laughs> thing and then yeah. all this stuff plugs onto it, into it, whatever, you know? Well, and, and there's an actual term for it. Oh, good. I know you're familiar with it. It's called the learning stack. Oh. And um, I thought you were going to be the Mr. Potato the Head Mr. thing, Potato and I was going to be really impressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, Phil Hill has written about this, and um, Marty Harris from Gartner has written about this. Yeah. But the idea is that it's um, the LMS serves as a basic foundation for right. some of the main stuff you, you want to do. And then you integrate custom apps through standards-based tools right, right. to build a custom version for your for either your institution or yourself as a faculty member or perhaps yourself as a student. Mm-hmm. So, for example, say um, say that you and I are both students in a class, okay. and there is an integration built into the learning management system that allows me to plug uh, Dropbox into mm-hmm, it, because that's mm-hmm. where I keep my stuff, right. but you've got OneDrive, mm-hmm. so you plug OneDrive into it. Well, 
we both now have kind of two different versions of the LMS that are customized mm -hmm. to meet our needs. We're plugging in our own personal apps mm -hmm. to allow us to manage our learning right, right, environment. Right. That's a very surfacey sort yeah, yeah, of yeah, sure. example, but it kind of illustrates the mm -hmm. point. And if you take it to its extreme, think about a, a learning management system perhaps as just a repository of a roster and allowing FERPA protected communications mm -hmm. and maybe a, a grade yep. book, or maybe yep. not even a grade book. Yep. And then all the elements and features of the LMS are plugged into it as standards based modules. Yep. Right. Right. Um, that gets really interesting then. And, oh, I agree. And it sort of disaggregates the whole LMS um, as, a, as a black box. And, and a bloated yeah. black yeah. box at that. Ooh, Absolutely. That was Try alliterative. <laughs> a bloated black box. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but maybe maybe we should say something about the next generation digital learning environment. You and I have both been yeah. involved with some of that uh, coming out of the Educause Learning Initiative. Yeah. Um, do you want to say a few words about, about well, that? Why don't you get this started? Because I don't do pithy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I don't either. But <laughs> so the, it has this awful acronym, and Malcolm Brown and Veronica Diaz would be the them. first to tell you how yeah, awful right. it is. But the NGDLE, Next Generation Digital Learning Environment, and the idea is to envision what is the the next thing mm -hmm. that's not an LMS mm -hmm. that can help manage um, digital learning. They're not mm -hmm. even saying online learning, mm -hmm. and they've come up with five different dimensions. And I think that they're pretty good, and they're mm -hmm. useful in thinking about um, what educators might need to enable digital learning um, in the future, or maybe mm -hmm. even the present. Right, right, right. So I'll run through them quickly. Number yep. one is interoperability and integration, mm -hmm. which um, allows the parts to be connected and to share data. That's Some, kind of what we've been talking about. Yeah, that's kind of similar to what I what I just said, but that mm -hmm. also overlaps the next one, which is personalization, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that learning environments and activities can be tailored to individual users. Um, the next is analytics, advising, and learning assessment, mm -hmm. so that um, uh, course level learning analytics as, as well as planning and advising systems that focus on student success can be a part of this environment. Uh, collaboration, um, which is, I think, uh, a broad term that implies a lot of different kinds of interactions, mm -hmm. student to student, student faculty, mm -hmm. um, you know, faculty to faculty, you know, whatever uh, the case might be. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, accessibility and universal design. And I'm, I'm pleased that they put yeah, this yeah, yeah. at a at the same level as yeah. these other things, because that's becoming more and more important um, so that everybody can, can access education. Yeah, I think what I'm fascinated by is, is the, the conversation thus far, we've been talking about, again, this kind of this Miss Potato Head kind of core, the learning stack that you plug things into. And this sort of, at first glance, sounds a lot like that, except that um, I know they would say that um, at Educause, the NGDLE stuff, that maybe it, this is not really the next generation LMS. An LMS might be part of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that messes with my mind a, a little bit because I'm trying to get my head around you know, how this would all play out. And uh, and it's more about the, there, maybe there's not a potato head. There's just the little parts and somehow they, more like Lego bricks, yeah, I guess. Yeah, think about it as Legos. That's yeah. the stack metaphor, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. Right. And, I, and I think that works because there are certain Lego parts that are shaped certain ways and yeah. they work for some kids and, they, right, right. and other kids want to build something else. That's right. So, uh, I, you know, when I was involved early on with some of the NGDLE um, discussions, there was some criticism of the LMS in mm -hmm. the room by yeah. the, by the yeah. participants. And I, I was never one of those. I, mm -hmm. I don't hate the LMS. Right. I, I actually think the LMS has enabled us to do some really amazing things here relative to online mm -hmm. learning and yeah. student access and interaction. I understand its limitations, and yeah. I understand, but there are there are limitations in a face-to-face -face classroom just because of the way the classroom is set up. Sure, you would love to do certain things in that classroom, but you can't because you've got four square walls and you've got certain kinds of desks, and so you make the best you can. And Unless you take your class outside and sit under a tree. Right. Yes, but you can do that online too with exactly. a laptop or a <laughs> tablet. That's right. Take everybody out into the blogosphere or something. That's right. Yeah. But there's still a classroom to go back to, though. Yeah. yeah. And so I think about that. You know, it's not just abandoning this. I mean, there is still sort of home base. And anytime, if you're going to have institutional education, uh, let alone institutional online education, you got to have some kind of home base. Absolutely. Yeah. 
and st- you need structure, like yeah. it or not, you need yeah. structure. And so as much flexibility as you can give faculty and administrators to, to manage that environment, to do the kinds of creative things they want to do. Mm-hmm. I do think there's, there's work to be done and there's a, there's a bright future, um, but I, I'm not going to I'm not going to bash the LMS because I, I actually have, have really appreciated what it's done for us. Oh, sure. Well, I don't know if that's a great place to, to leave it, but what I'm kind of hearing us say is that, well, there's a lot of options, right? But the LMS is probably going to continue to be a part of whatever online education is or, or becomes in the future. It's probably still likely to be a, an important part of that equation. Yeah. Which, I, I think that's true, and and you know, kind of as we were saying, the LMS or or whatever it may evolve into, um, will continue to be a part of it. But but what we see are increasing flexibility yep. and personalization in yep. that environment. A- absolutely, which is, you know, we were t- we started this talking about conflation, but that description, that statement you just made, is probably, hopefully, true of online education as well. Yeah, let's hope. <laughs> so on a hopeful note, my coffee's gone. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, until next time, for TopCast, I'm Tom. And I'm Kelvin. See ya. Hey, before you go, since we're a year into this podcast, it's a great time for us to say thanks for listening. But we'd like to hear from you. Please let us know what you like, what you don't like, and what changes you'd like to see. Feel free to send us an email with your comments to topcast at UCF. If you include your mailing address, we'll even send you a custom TopCast device sticker.